Um, as Ms. Fran Bourne would say, you're in for a real treat. Um, <laughs> Um, my mom, uh, she was born in Illinois, and um, the one thing that I advise you not to do is to mispronounce that, because um, if you add the S at the end, Illinois, she might hurt you. And um, she, uh, after she finished high school, she went and lived in Italy for a year and a half. And she traveled all around there. She's been to Switzerland, and she's been to... Uh, even Canada, she said. And what really gets me is that she went to London a couple of years ago, and she left me at my uncle's house. And I didn't get to go. And so, um, yeah, she's been all over, so she knows what she's talking about. So um, you're in for a real treat. <laughs> I just have to tell you, um, Vicki was worried about being discreet handing out papers, so I just want to let you know that I'm behind this podium, but if there's any problem, please feel free to interrupt me. Um, I was at one lectureship, uh, Ladies' Day, and the lady speaking, I was sort of off to the side from her podium. I noticed something a little funny, and I looked a little closer, and her skirt was slowly sliding down her body, and she didn't know. And I was in college, and all her, you know, co-workers were in there with her and I didn't think it was my place to rush up there and tell her and it went all the way to her knees before someone got up and told her so if my skirt starts sliding down please feel free to interrupt me the cameras are rolling and I would much prefer an interruption um, to the humiliation all right today as you know we are discussing Lydia and I'm gonna get you to turn to the book of Acts chapter 16 <coughs> Also, pardon me, I'm still got some signs left over from a cold. Um, while you're turning there, I just want to give you a quick introduction of the book of Acts, which is one of my favorites. And if, if some of you don't know, I teach uh, for the Brown Trail School of Preaching in the Wives program. I teach the Acts class, and I teach James through Jude following that. And Acts is one of my favorite books. Um, it is pivotal. If you don't understand that for centuries, God's special called out people were referred to as Israelites, his people Israel. And they had special rules and special laws and a special place to live and a special purpose. But in the book of Acts, we find the place where all that transitions and these centuries of knowing that they were God's special called out people are now changing and so as you read through the book of Acts, outside of just the story of Lydia, um, you need to understand that these people are dealing with major changes in their life. Um, certain things to think about while you're looking in Acts chapter 2 before they start baptizing those who are willing to take on Christ, to put on Christ. There were no Christians in the world. Everyone was lost for just a moment in time. It's amazing. And then all of a sudden, pow! 3,000 and at least 12 brand new Christians. Uh, it's just so exciting. So it's, it's everything to us as Christians. It's the only book in the Bible that tells us how to become a Christian, how to put on Christ, how to be saved. There are several references into the letters about things involving that, but the, the actual function of it, how is the church supposed to live? What are we supposed to think and do and feel? Um, I need to watch my time. Uh, okay, so as we approach Lydia, a little bit of background. Uh, and you can, um, you've got the outline there, and I will, if you're not taking notes, ask you to jot down a couple things that I need to add a little information to and, and one little clerical area, area, error, but I'll get there in a moment. Um, this was Paul's second missionary journey. His first one had been after a large um, interruption in the church, a large uh, argument, you might say, because those who had been Jews and were now Christians were wanting those who had been Greeks and were now Christians to take on much of the Mosaic law, including circumcision. And so they finally came to the conclusion, circumcision is circumcision of the heart. And not to go too deep into this, the first missionary uh, journey, Paul and Barnabas went out to comfort the churches. Look, 
you can't hold people to an old law that has been completed. This is the new law, and this is what we hold to, and, and we need to be unified in mind and love one another, and, and that's what they went around telling. The second missionary trip at the onstart, as you well know, uh, he and Barnabas got into a heated argument over whether or not to take Mark, who happened to be Barnabas' nephew, uh, on this second trip, who had turned back on the first. It was such a heated debate that Paul, um, they decided to separate. And Barnabas and the aforementioned Mark, thank you, um, they went to the islands. They started in Crete and went around. But Paul went up. If you look at your map on your handout, he started in Antioch in Syria, and that's across the Mediterranean Sea all the way to the right side. And he went up through the areas of Cilicia and all that, kind of his hometown stomping grounds. And he wanted to go into these areas. You'll see Pisidia, uh, Phrygia, Asia, Lydia, Mycia, all those areas he wanted to go into. That section of land was called Asia at the time. Um, Bithynia even at the top of that section right underneath the Black Sea. But the Holy Spirit forbade him from doing so. God had another purpose. So I just want to very quickly call out to your attention as you look through Asia, some of the cities that are there that you're familiar with, um, First of all, as you go to the west, he did make it to Derby and Lystra, where he picked up Timothy. Timothy was made a Christian and came with Paul on the rest of the journey. And then he went north to skip those areas and sort of skirted across uh, the top of the area, and they stopped in Troas. But some of the cities that he did not get to go to included Ephesus, Colossae, and Thyatira. So keep that in mind. He did not go to those places. God sent him past those places to where he had in mind. It was while he was in Troas, and I've got a picture. These are the ancient ruins. And to me, it, it helps tremendously to have a picture in my mind. These were real places and real people and real examples for us to follow. These are some of the ancient ruins. Paul would have walked through that arch in Troas when it was covered and complete and beautiful. This is the harbor there, the ancient harbor. You can see it's no longer a harbor, but this is the view he would have seen looking across uh, to the island of Samothrace. Um, okay. So they are in Troas, and Paul receives what we refer to as the Macedonian call. He has a vision there. Um, oh, and let me back up. Luke, the author of Acts, uh, was not always with them on each of these trips. But at this point, in this time, and it says Luke accompanied them, um, they picked up Luke apparently in Troas. And he went with them to Philippi. So I just want to make that clear on the outline. He didn't accompany them on the entire missionary trip. In this section, he was with them. Okay, so, um, and then I give you the proof. So we have uh, Silas and Paul, Timothy and Luke are in this group. And there may have been others that were not mentioned. So from Troas, they take across uh, the sea after, well, let's just go. Chapter 16, and I'm going to back up some into verse 6. They passed through the Phrygian and the Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And after they came to Mycenae, they were trying to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. And passing by Mycenae, they came down to Troas. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Remember that including Greeks into the kingdom of God was a whole new concept still for them to try to to take care of. Now, Acts did cover a 30, um, Brother Edwards mentioned yesterday, 40-year period, the first 30 to 40 years of the church. So it wasn't brand, brand new since Peter and the vision and Cornelius, but it was still a fairly new concept. So 
um, Paul was on his way to full-blooded Greeks to preach the gospel to them. Verse 11, so putting out to sea from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and on that day following to Neapolis. So they went from Troas to the island of Samothrace, right out there in the middle of the Mediterranean. And it's just stunning, very rocky island. There are some really great pictures that were copyrighted <laughs> that I wanted to share with you, but they're, it's a really beautiful place. And the, the day I was putting this together, it was freezing cold in the room where I was, and I was looking at all these Greek islands and this beautiful blue sea, and it's not helping make me feel any warmer, but just making me want to be somewhere else. Okay. And then this is the modern port of Kavala, Greece, but um, you can still see part of an ancient wall across the front there. Um, that would be the port of Neapolis. Apparently it was pretty, pretty small at the time because they did not stay there. They went approximately 12 miles or so inland to Philippi, the first place that uh, God sent Paul. Keeping in mind, God sent Paul around all these places to Philippi. Okay, Paul's practice, as usual, was to try to find a synagogue. Well, on the other side of your handout, you will see a basic timeline. And this is from the commentary on Acts of the Apostles by H. Leo Bowles. It's part of that Gospel Advocate commentary series. Really great book. Um, and he does mention that these times are somewhat approximate. There are some dates that we can know pretty well because Luke was a doctor, a physician, and tremendously in, uh, interested in details. And so he detailed a lot about the emperor's names, places, so much detail that we can date certain acts in acts. <laughs> um, but the, the current emperor, Roman emperor, was Claudius, and he's mentioned twice. Um, and so uh, he had made an edict not long before this, I believe, because You'll notice where it says Paul's second missionary journey was only a two-year period of time. After he leaves Philippi, he's going to go to Thessalonica, and then on down to Athens, and then down to Corinth. And in Corinth, he stays a year and a half. So we're talking a six-month period of time. It didn't take long. My point being, Claudius had issued an edict. He was big on edicts. And um, one of them was that the Jews were no longer allowed in Rome. Um, they were being a bit problematic at the time, and part of the reason was because of Christianity. They were causing riots with Christians down in Alexandria, Egypt. They had caused a huge riot down there with the Egyptians who couldn't stand anybody. <coughs> and so he made an edict no longer in Rome. Philippi was a bustling city. This is, okay, let me back up. These are the ancient ruins of Philippi, and it's just a small section. And there's my little yellow arrow that took me forever till I found out that they have automatic shapes. Um, that's the theater there, and it's quite possible Paul might have spoken there. Um, but they would have sporting events. They would have uh, plays and things that, that they would offer in that place. And like Brother Edwards mentioned yesterday, you could be at the top and hear the man at the bottom just fine. Uh, you'll see the forum, and I point that out because the forum uh, in Roman culture was a place where they would gather for political, for financial things, and so, uh, as you know, Lydia was a seller of pur purple fabrics. It's quite possible because of the elite nature of what she did that she had a shop somewhere around that forum. I'm not saying she did. I'm just saying that would be typical. Um, and then I'll back a little further out. Uh, the same theater and the same forum that I just showed you. And you can see kind of down around the bottom of the edges uh, where there's sort of a tree line. I believe that's where the ancient walls were. They did have ancient walls. The city was established in 500-something B.C. Um, and so you can still see. You can tell how big a city this was. Philippi made money from gold mines all through the ancient times. And so it was a very wealthy center. It's right on the coast. It's on the way from Italy. If you look back at your map, on the way from Italy across over to um, the mainland there, if they didn't want to go by sea, 
you know, across the Mediterranean to Judea, um, if they were going up to the regions we now know as Turkey and stuff. Anyway, it was right there in the middle, bustling center. Philippi was it. It was, they referred to it as the Little Rome. Now, all this is to tell you that such an important city uh, had very few Jews in it. All through history, it was a little Rome. I mean, th a lot of the citizens who were put there were, were um, elite members of the Praetorian Guard who helped avenge Julius Caesar's death. I mean, the history is just amazing. But they were Romans in, in large part. Very few Jews at all, if any. My point also being that Claudius had made that edict to get all the Jews out of Rome. Well, they would have followed Roman law. And likely there were no Jews in Philippi. Now, um, let's get back to Lydia herself. Uh, verse 12. From there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony, and we were staying in the city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, here's his typical practice, we went outside the gate to a riverside. Why? Because there's no synagogue. Paul always visited the synagogues first. He always gave the Jews a chance first to accept the gospel. But there was no synagogue. And if there's not a synagogue, which basically is just um, a group, it's not a building. It's sort of like the word church. A synagogue would be a group of believers who, who believe the same. Um, so we went out to the river where it was typical for them to gather. We were supposing there would be a place of prayer. And we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled there. No men at all. Verse 14. A woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. So you can see my arrow out to the river there. And this is a picture of the river. Okay. Um... It might have been much bigger then, but it wouldn't necessarily have to have been. Uh, I call it Lydia's River. It might have been the Ganges, Ganbrides, not sure uh, on the name of that, but that was Lydia's River where they gathered. Okay. Um, she was listening, and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. Okay, so let's look at this. There were only women gathered there. This is the first person Paul spoke to after the Macedonian call. So God sends him across Asia to Philippi, and the first person he meets is a woman. And so the first point I want to make, which is in, somewhat in my outline, I don't know if I made that very clear, is that Lydia was thi from Thyatira. She was a wealthy businesswoman, very successful in what she did. The Roman emperors, what color did they wear? Um, I'll show you in a minute. It was, it was purple, and the purple family from the dyes could be anything from scarlet red down to blue. Uh, the main one in Tyre across the Mediterranean Sea, that's that Tyre purple. That would be that deep purple that we all know and love as a royal purple. But on this side, in Thyatira, it was known for a scarlet red. This is called a matter root. And you might add this note to your outline because it kind of bothers me that I didn't include it. In Tyre, they made the dye from mollusks. It was a lengthy and malodorous, means it stunk really bad, and they were known for how they smelled. Um, but it was beautiful, and they loved the purple. But where was it? It was way across the Mediterranean Sea. And the Romans figured out pretty soon, we're going to run out of money because they had just conquered Britain, and things were getting tough because the Gauls and the barbarians. Okay. Um, I homeschool, <laughs> so I love these details. Um, they didn't want to go all the way to Tyre. They wanted to save some money and get their purple, red, scarlet fabrics from Thyatira instead, which was half the distance. So it was cheaper, and it was still beautiful. And you'll see a lot of paintings, even still, frescoes of those red um, swatches over the togas or even red togas. Most likely, that fabric came from Thyatira and quite possibly was sold to them by Lydia, if we're talking, you know, in the first century. Just amazing things to think about. Okay, so he passed Thyatira to get to whom? 
Lydia. My point being, God included her in his plan. And anyone who thinks that Christianity um, and God himself are exclusionary of women, you know, um, biased against women, they don't understand God or scripture at all. This woman played a part. And let's take a closer look at this. Um, I'm going to go over to lessons from Lydia. <coughs> First of all, we learn that Lydia was ready for God with her heart and her mind. It makes me think of Deuteronomy. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. And she did. Okay, she was listening. Verse 14. She gave attention to God's word. She was willing and desirous to know God. And she had that open heart. And the word in the King James is attended. She attended to the things spoken of by Paul. In my New American Standard, it says uh, responded. She responded. Well, that word means, this is amazing, to give heed. But here, apply oneself to, to attach oneself to, to hold on and cleave to a person or a thing, to be given or addicted to, to devote thought or effort to. Um, she responded. She took on God completely. Now, she was already a worshiper of God, possibly a proselyte. I think definitely not a Jew. Lydia is even a very Roman name. It's from the Greek, but it was a very popular Roman name. Um, possibly a proselyte, but compared to Cornelius, a worshiper of God, she already had that love of God in her heart. And so when she heard the words that, that were given to her from him, she immediately responded. No questions asked. Um, she, was, she had a ready soul. Lydia accepted the things taught by God, was baptized into Christ, and to her, pleasing God was more valuable than any financial standing she could have. And I say this because Thyatira, of which I don't have any pictures because they only have like one square block that's excavated. It's a really busy, bustling city in, in Turkey. Um, was situated, it was landlocked, but between two rivers. So they did have travel. It was a huge center of commerce in between the two areas. Um, and it was known for its guilds. Guilds would be kind of like unions. Um, they, they have inscriptions to guilds for makers of fabric, which affects us. Those who make dye, bronze people. I mean, every kind of thing you can imagine. But the guilds each had their own specific god. And when they got together for their meetings, which was pretty regular, they would have a blowout feast, Roman style, and it would include embarrassingly disgusting, horrible acts that they included as worship to their guild god as a part of their meeting. Now, it's very clear to me, Lydia most likely had two homes, one in Philippi and one back in Thyatira, where she would get her supplies, come back and sell. And she and her household, possibly they sewed the fabrics into what they wanted. Perhaps they wove the fabrics. Um, I think dyeing was a special thing, and probably she wasn't involved in that, but that's a guess based on my study. But anyway, she and her household were busy, but they were obviously not busy like this. They were gathered at the river to pray to God and to worship him. And so when she became a Christian, she was really willing to even offend them and possibly jeopardize her business in the process. Though um, she sort of drops out of sight, Paul mentions in Philippians that when he went down to Thessalonica and he was having such a hard time, that they sent a gift to him. And you've got to know Lydia was involved in that. She's wealthy. She's a woman. So she thinks about things like that, what people might need. And um, so she was willing to put herself out there. I just see a tremendous courage in her that we could all emulate. Um, and also her servants became her sisters. That's just a lot to think about right there. Lydia was ready with her strength. Lydia served. She considered hospitality 
as part of being faithful to God. She used her blessings to serve God's people. And she was not only willing to serve, but she prevailed upon them to let her serve. She wasn't going to take no for an answer. She felt like she was serving God, and you would rob me of the opportunity to serve God if you don't let me serve you. And plus, she was probably just loved them the way we do our preachers that we come across. Um, and she had provisions available to serve. She actually was ready for them to immediately come to her house. And we'll address that in a moment. Quickly. <laughs> um, I think I have 16 minutes left. Uh, she was a ready resource for God. Um, she was there waiting for God when Paul arrived. She became a respite and a resource for the Christians uh, in the area. And in Revelation 2, verses 18 through 24, Thyatira was one of the seven churches in Asia. And you just have to think, did she go back and share the gospel with her friends at home? Did she go back and make provision for those preachers to come and share the gospel with her friends at home? Lydia was important to the growth of the church in the first century. Um, and her readiness allowed her a great role in that spread of that church. So our personal ed applications, as Eddie Parrish would say, so what? Oh, I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, what's the so what part of this? Well, like Lydia, we need to have ready hearts. We must give regular attention to God's word. Because we know in Hosea 4, verse 6, what? The people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. James 1, 21, we're supposed to receive his word implanted within us. Romans 10, 17, we know that without faith it's impossible to please him. And how do we receive faith? By hearing and hearing from the word of God. 1 Peter 3, 5, we are told we must be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks from us, what is this hope you have within you? I see something in you. What is this all about? And we're supposed to be ready to give an answer. And if we don't know anything about this book, we're not going to be ready to give that answer. Um, Hebrews 5.12 talks about those who should now be teachers, but yet they're still on the milk of the word. And so we're to grow in his grace and in his knowledge, there's an expectation of Christian growth here. Not happy with just sitting by and saying, well, that's really not my strong point. You're getting involved. You're learning the word. You're sharing it with your family, with your friends. You're teaching Bible classes. You're involved in all of that. Um, that's the growth that God expects of his children, to be confident in the one thing he gave us to guide us, and that's his word. Titus 1, chapter 9, like Lydia did clinging to someone, cleaving, it says to cling to his word for dear life. Do we do that? I know I don't. I'm pretty familiar with this word, but I don't day by day make this my priority. I let things get in my way quite often. Um... In Psalm 119, verse 11, it says, Thy word have I hidden my heart that I may not sin against you. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 through 11, mentions those people who did not have a love for the truth. And in the next verse, it mentions how, and because they had no love of the truth, God let them believe a delusion and therefore be lost. If we are not in this word, what... What's going to hook us? What are we going to believe? Are we going to be like the denominations and, oh, that sounds good. That sounds right. That makes me feel warm. That makes me feel fuzzy. That makes me feel more beloved in God because I love more people than he does. Are we going to believe that garbage because we're not in the word and understanding that God gave everything for all of us to get to heaven and it's our fault if we don't get there? All right. Also, we must give priority to prayer and worship. Would they find us at the river, ladies? Um, are we making time for this on a daily basis? Is this part 
of our schedule. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18 are the famous rejoice always. We sort of skim over that. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. These are supposed to be everyday parts of our lives. Hebrews 10, 23 through 25. Um, he warns us not to abandon the assembling of the saints. You know, back in the first century, you can read all through Acts. They spent every day together. Brother Edwards brought this out. They spent every day together. They wanted to be together. They were clinging even to each other. And it was a hard time for them in these 30 to 40 years. There were even famines. They were without money. A lot of them at the very beginning had come from other countries, became Christians there and stayed. They had nothing. But a love for each other. And they looked out for each other. And we can't be bothered. Um, this is probably the wrong crowd, but to show up on Wednesday nights because we want to hear the word of God. Oh, I don't want to go to the river. That's, I'm tired. Okay. Um, and I love the example of Daniel. In Daniel 1 verse 8, uh, you will read that before he got to Babylon, he and his three friends, they did what? They made up their minds not to defile themselves. And what was part of that? In Daniel um, chapter 6, verse 10, it says that he, even though he was threatened with his very life, he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God. I don't do that. Three times a day, every day, he made time. He had made up his mind. This is my lifestyle. This is how I'm going to live, even in this foreign land. And ladies, make no mistake, we are in a foreign land. Our citizenship, if we are Christians, is in heaven. All right. And we must desire to know and to please God. And this needs to be on our hearts and minds every day. Matthew 6, he made a promise. He said, Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. You just make this your priority. I know I've used that example before of someone who's practicing for the Olympics. Um, let's say it's a, a, a girl who skates. That's her job. She skates because she wants to win. Her parents take care of all the details for her or her coach, the extraneous people around her. And God said, I'll do that for you. You seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Let me worry about that. You worry about what your job is, and I'll take care of the rest. Matthew 7, 7, and Luke eleven nine. 9, he says, and not just ask once, you continually knock, you continually seek, and you continually ask, and I will continually bless. As soon as we stop those things, the blessings will stop. Acts 17 um, just across the way, when Paul is talking to the people in Athens, he tells them that God created us to long for him. And we ignore that, and our lives are going to be out of kilter. Are things wrong? Are you upset? Are you depressed? I know that there are physiolog physiological reasons for that. But let's take a look sometimes, ladies. Do we have our priorities out of whack? Because that will upset us. Because God made us to long and desire for him. In 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 1 through 7, God has called us to what? Holiness, pureness, a sanctified life that's not touched by the world. We're in the world, not of the world, and we're pleasing God because of it. And if you follow down to verse 9, you'll notice that having a sincere love for each other is a part of this. We must have ready souls. We have to have eternity in heaven as priority over everything else. Um, I'm trying to skip through to the end, so I shall hurry. You can read those verses. Um, we must be willing to repent and respond when convicted. You know, ladies, we have a problem with this. We generally wear our hearts on our sleeves, and anything anybody says, we're going to immediately assume that they meant it to offend us, aren't we? Oftentimes. Um, but that is not what we are about. When we're confronted with something, 
we must respond in kind. One of our duties that we're given is to admonish and exhort each other. Admonish means, look, you're, you're straying off the path. I'm going to help you get back on the middle of the road. But if we're like, oh, do you know what she said to me? I can't believe she talked to me that way. I am so tired of her thinking that she is so much better than me and everything she does. And I'm just... We need to be willing, like Lydia, to immediately slough it off. I don't want this on me. Hebrews 12, get rid of everything that might hold you back and the sin that entangles us. It doesn't have to be sin to keep us from heaven. We can get so tangled in something that we make it a sin because it's now become a priority over God. We need to be willing when we're confronted with these things to clear them out of our lives and make that way straight and stay in the middle not to the right or the left. All right. Um, We have to submit to God's word even when it challenges our lifestyle, like Lydia. Um, She's an example. The Philippian jailer that that you're about to meet later in the chapter, he was an example. He risked his job by becoming a Christian. Um, The saints in Ephesus, when, when they first got there, they were into all that sorcery and all that stuff. And when they became Christians, what they do? They piled all those books and everything in a pile and burned them. 50,000 pieces of silver's worth of this. Are we willing to do the same? Will we go through our movie cabinets, our books? Do we do that? Are we having that willing heart to long for God like her? And we must be ready to serve. Uh, We have to see our homes and our possessions as tools of hospitality. And let me back up where it says 2 Corinthians 8, verses 9 through 11. That's actually chapter 7. Um, And that tells us the difference between the results of godly sorrow and repentance and the other kinds. Our homes and our possessions are a tool to serve God through serving his people. And if we're not doing that, we're falling short. Period. It's in the qualifications for elder. His wife has to be given to hospitality. What do we think that means? Um, It was regularly practiced by the first Christians. They would sell things and share things, and that may not necessarily be what he means here, but we're to be open to one another, love, and comfort each other. Lydia was a source of comfort. We have to be a source of encouragement to the body of Christ because those are the people for whom Christ died. What value do they have? We must be a sort of respite and care when things go wrong. Like she was, I've got one other picture. This is the front of the prison, and that is apparently a preacher from um, Zion, Illinois. (laughs) I found these pictures, but that's the front of the prison. This is open. It would have been in a tunnel. That's a prison cell in Philippi, ladies and gentlemen. This, ladies, not gentlemen. <laughs> um, these gentlemen were in here singing praises to God. Look at that place. I, I used to live in Italy, as Sarah mentioned, and right out in the middle of the open is a little neglected, ignored town called Alba Fuchins. No one goes there. They don't protect it in any way. Um, and I have proof because I have a tile from the road in my box at home. But um, the uh, prison in that town, you had to climb down under the ground, and there was water pouring. It was just this tunnel, and they had things to hold your hands to the wall. I'm sure this was like that. Look, they sat on the floor, on the ground, wet, damp, cold. They were singing and praying. And this leads me to my last point, that by serving others, Let's skip to the end of chapter 16. Um, They went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia, who was there. She was hosting worship in her home. She was having the brethren in her home. Um, And when they saw the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. So make no mistake, women. We're important to the church. It's our duty to love and serve God with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. It is our duty, our requirement to serve his people and exhibit hospitality. But he promises us that if we do that, we will also be encouraged. Have you ever had anyone in your home and it seems like you're the one who comes out the better for it? 
I feel that way. And they who we would think in today's world were the ones who needed encouragement, they encouraged the brethren who went on with courage to spread the gospel and send gifts to each other and host each other and visit Paul when he was in Rome and nearly die for each other on multiple occasions. So open your home. Don't be Martha, though. Don't get so lost in the details that I can't open my home, or if you do open your home, you're so lost in the details that you miss the blessing. So ladies, are we ready? There's a little thing on the back. Um, Lydia was ready to see God's word with all her soul. She was devoted to the one true God. She was listening with her heart, and she responded to God's commands. What are we going to do with this information today? Would you all pray with me, please? Dear Holy God and Father, we do love you, and we come before you today with open hearts. And we pray that you keep our hearts open, that we will willingly respond to your words like a folding door opening, as your word implies. We want to always serve you, dear God, and we want to be devoted to you and dedicated to you. So please let us take these lessons that you have taught us today and apply them to our lives and be better Christians and better women and love each other more and to become known as the Lydia's in the kingdom that people know they can come to us for respite and care and, and love and commitment. And God, thank you for, for your complete and perfect word that gives us these examples and gives us this knowledge that we can please you and that we can live in heaven. And we thank you for the sacrifice of your son, how it was done willingly on your part and his part, and the enormity of which we will never understand until we are home with you in heaven. Help us to be lights in your world, to spread your kingdom, and to always be known by our love. It's through your blessed son's holy name that we pray. Amen.